Okay, thank you. So, yeah, so I, I think I think it's better this way that that we 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 do first the lectures and then the tutorials. Otherwise, uh, since since I was supposed to have two lectures after the tutorials, this this was uh, problematic. So I think this is the best thing, and also also since I don't really know how fast I will be moving, and and how long. Also, I mean, one and a half hours for the exercises maybe not enough. So so doing it this way, I think we have more freedom to 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 change things around. So so I, I, I'm sure this will be the best thing. Okay, so, and, and then the second thing I want to say is I, I was following Ifa's uh, uh, lecture and uh, I, please, please interrupt and please ask uh, and so on, because uh, this should be a dynamical uh, process. Uh, I, I, I have no idea what, uh, I mean, I know a bit what you've been doing in this, in this, uh, um in this school and so on but i have a very little idea of what is your background and and what is uh, what you know and don't know uh, so so this means it's important for you to to to, to give me some feedback uh, okay and this is what i plan to do uh roughly uh so this is the the, the outline of of my course I will start uh, with a small uh, reminder of the standard model and flavor symmetry. So I know you had the lectures by, by Yuval and I know also, uh, I mean, you should know a bit about the standard model already, but, but it's never uh, a bad idea to, to uh, repeat uh, certain important things. So this I will, I will start today with this uh, first chapter. Um, then I will, I will motivate uh, that, uh, so I will try to convince you that the standard model is an effective field theory, okay? And this uh, really has nothing to do with new physics or anything like this. It's, it's I, in my opinion, it's a more fundamental concept, uh, but of course, it's a, a very useful thing to, to have in mind when when testing the standard model and looking for new particles. Then I will talk a little bit about flavor in the, what is called the, 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 the SMEFT or the standard model EFT, which I will define properly here, okay? In case you don't know what this is. Uh, but the, the, there is, a, one can talk for, for years about flavor in the SMEFT. I will only, uh, talk about this briefly, the main ingredients. And then I will go to what I think is the most important thing if you're doing flavor uh, today, because although it's true that uh, now we are seeing a lot of flavor in at high energies, uh, as I will try to motivate and explain in this course, uh, flavor physics uh, mostly has to do with with um, with decays of, of 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 mesons and things like this. Okay, I, I will also try to explain why this is the case. Okay, and why this is the 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 the, the best idea when one is doing flavor, uh, but one has to go below the electronic scale, and this is an important chapter. And then I will talk about the probably this will already happen tomorrow. Okay, or maybe. Maybe we can get here today also. Let's see what, how, we, how fast we go. But uh, then I will talk about with the cases VSM probes. And then there is a last chapter here. Uh, I put some parentheses because I don't know if I will be able to, to, to arrive here. But I want to talk about the matching calculations in VSM models, okay? And here I, I wrote a small note. Uh, I will focus on heavy new physics. Okay, so I will I will focus on on flavor as a tool to to reach uh, to high scales where there might be new physics. Okay, and this is only half of the story. Uh, there could be light uh, new physics. Okay, you can have axions. You can have a lot of there is a lot of motivated uh, new particles that are light, okay? And 
Flavor also has something to say about this, uh, this, this BSM physics, okay? So what I'm going to tell you is just half of the story, but it's the most traditional one, and it's already enough for a, for a four hour course. So, so I will focus on heavy new physics, but uh, you, should, you should be aware that this is only half of the story. Any questions about this? All right, so let's uh, let's start with a quick uh, standard model uh, review. Uh, here I write the four main ingredients uh, that enter the definition of the standard model. The standard model is is a renormalizable quantum field theory, and here I I did two things. One is uh, put the word renormalizable in in a fancy color. Okay, and the other thing I did was to put a, an asterisk here, okay, because I will be questioning this uh, axiom later on. Okay, so it's a renormalizable quantum field theory with a gauge symmetry. Okay, that's the first important. Uh, by the way, QFT means, means uh, Lorentz invariance and quantum mechanics. Okay, so here. Uh, this contains uh, the, the two most important ingredients of, 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 of the standard model. Um, but then besides, uh, besides this uh, quantum mechanics and special relativity, one has a gauge symmetry and uh, one has to specify the gauge group. In the case of the standard model is SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. You know this, okay? And then one has to specify also uh, what are the matter fields. Okay, uh, so the field content, and not only which, which are the matter fields, but also in which representations they live in this, uh, in this gauge uh, group. Okay, and uh, very schematically, this is the, the field content of the standard model. So you have uh, left-handed quarks, uh, right-handed right U quarks, right-handed D quarks, left-handed leptons, and the right-handed electron times three, because there are three copies of this uh, set. Why there are three copies, no one knows, it's a mystery. Um, and then one has a scalar field, the Higgs, which is important because it's uh, related to the fourth uh, ingredient of the standard model, which is uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking of the gauge symmetry. And in the standard model, this happens because this scalar field uh, has a, has a non-zero value for this vacuum expectation value, okay? And then this, we give it a name, we call it V for, for vacuum expectation value. And the fact that this is non-zero, uh, since H uh, transforms in a non-trivial way under the gauge group, uh, if you want to give a vacuum expectation value, you have to break the symmetry. So this spontaneously breaks uh, this uh, symmetry to, to SU3 color times, uh, times uh, U1 uh, electromagnetism. And as I said, you have to specify the representations. And this table here uh, is giving you all the information regarding the transformation of these fields uh, according to the gate symmetry. And this is very easy to remember. So quarks are threes of SU3. The rest are singlets, okay? The rest are not uh, colored particles. And then concerning SU2 left, all the left-handed uh, objects are doublets and the Higgs is also a doublet, otherwise you wouldn't be able to break the SU2 left uh, symmetry, but the right-handed guys are singlets, okay? And then for the hypercharge, um, I have to be honest, I, I, it's always difficult for me to remember hypercharges, I remember the, the electric charges, but not the hypercharges, but this is very simple. And I just give you here uh, my, my mnemotechnic rule to remember hypercharges. First of all, the Higgs is one over two, okay? This is a choice, but it's easy to remember. Then the right-handed guys are, hypercharges are the same as charges. So here you have the electron with minus one, the down, uh, type uh, right-handed quark with minus one, three, and you uh, right-handed quark uh, two thirds. And then for the left-handed, you just uh, write the, the structure of the Yukawa couplings. And then with this uh, in mind, which is easy to write, 
okay? You have to write the a Q bar with a hex to get something that is invariant under SU2 and a left bar with a hex to get something that is invariant under SU2. And then you put that an additional right handed guide here. And then by uh, requiring that these uh, terms are, are uh, zero hypercharged, you can, you can derive easily uh, these uh, this, uh, this two numbers here. Okay, there is also some formula, something like T3 minus Q or plus Q or something like this. I never remember this, but this is essentially what it means. Okay, so this you sum these things, you get the hype. The hype. Okay, so I, you should know this. Okay, uh, and then the procedure is the following. Uh, first, you write the Lorentz invariant, gauge invariant Lagrangian with all the fields that you have in your table here, okay? And uh, you write all possible terms up to canonical dimension four. And this dimension you calculate by knowing that scalars are dimension one, fermions are dimension three halves, and gauge fields are dimension one, okay? And then, um, and then this is, uh, this is, uh, what you get is the standard model Lagrangian, okay? And here, again, you see this asterisk here, it's the same asterisk I'm putting here, right here. And this asterisk means uh, that the reason you stop at dimension four, okay, is because you want this theory to be renormalizable, okay? And this means you have a, a finite number of terms in this Lagrangian, which is also something which is uh, helpful. Once you have written this Lagrangian, you have to renormalize it, okay? And then uh, you have to fix all renormalized couplings uh, from a set of experimental measurements, okay? So this Lagrangian has a number of terms. Each term has a, has a number in front, which you don't know what it is. And then you have to fix these numbers from experiment before you are able to predict anything. So if you have 25 parameters, you need 25 measurements, you fix all these numbers. And after you've done that, you're able to use the theory uh, to calculate and to predict things. And this is step three, you use the theory, okay? You calculate observables, you make predictions, you test experimental measurements, you learn about the fundamental principles, which is the most important thing. Uh, if you, without this step, the, the whole thing is useless unless you want to do engineering, of course. And I think that's something we haven't uh, done much, <laughs> engineering of the standard model. But I think we're a bit far from, from finding useful things to do uh, besides research so far. But anyway, this is a very successful three-step process that has been going on for, for decades. And this uh, is uh, what I would say is the legacy of 20th century particle physics. Okay, uh, I guess you all agree with this uh, statement of the situation. Um, now, let's go back to step one, which is the building of the standard model Lagrangian. Uh, if you do that, you get something that looks like this, uh, four terms, or you can divide the Lagrangian into four pieces. The one is the one that contains uh, the pure gauge uh, uh, Lagrangian. Okay, so these Maxwell terms f f uh, uh, so f squared. Okay, of course you also have gauge fixing and and uh, and the ghosts and so on. It's, so so this is something you you have to add on top. You could uh, think that this uh, uh, will be added here. Okay, I will not uh, discuss this, uh, but okay, this, this contains all the gauge fields. Then one has the scalar part, which is this one here, okay? And then one has the fermionic uh, part of the Lagrangian, which is the one that involves all the fermion kinetic terms. But since this has to be gauge invariant, you have to put the covariant derivative here. And this also provides all the interactions of the fermions with gauge fields. Now you have uh, many fermions, okay? And that's why here you have uh, this, uh, so you're summing over phi and phi can be any of these five types of, of fermions. 
but you also have this IJ indices, and this is the flavor indices, because as mentioned before, you have three families or three copies of these five fermions. So, so you have these flavor indices that will appear everywhere in this course. Uh, it's called something generation also. Um, and in principle here, you can put IJ, IJ, et cetera. However, at this stage, it's always possible to put the Delta IJ here. So you can for free, always write the fermionic Lagrangian in this way. Uh, and the reason is this covariant derivative is, is a number in flavor space. It's not a matrix in flavor space. You see, if, you have, if you had masses here, so you, if you had a mass term, then of course you would have uh, Mij, and then um, this would mix all the, all the generations, but this is forbidden by gauge invariance. So you don't have this mass. And so you can always write, you can always uh, redefine your fermion fields at this stage in order to have a Delta Ij here, okay? And that's why the fermionic Lagrangian uh, always has uh, this diagonal form. Okay. Related to this is also the case. I didn't talk about the, this this uh, extra term here. This is a special term. Uh, this is in fact the most important term uh, regarding flavor. But if we look at these uh, three blue terms, uh, this part of the Lagrangian has a very large global symmetry, which is a U3 to the five symmetry, under which all the fermions transform in this way. So you can take separately all of the five types of fermions here, and you can do a unitary three by three uh, transformation by mixing all the all the genera all the all the generations, okay, within each fermion separately from all the other ones, okay? So at this stage, it makes no sense to, 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 see, to say what an electron is or to say what a muon is or a tau or what is a, a, an up-type quark, a down-type uh, or, or a charm. This that makes no sense because you can always rotate at will separately, all of them uh, and so on. Uh, this, is, this is a unitary matrix in three dimensions. So uh, U3, and since we have five fermions, one, two, three, four, five, uh, this leads to a global symmetry uh, under U3 to the five uh, 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 transformation, okay? This symmetry, uh, U3 to the five, is called the flavor symmetry, okay? So this is the first uh, thing uh, I wanted to say in this lecture. Uh, you already probably know this, but if you don't uh, remember this because it's important, this is what is called the flavor symmetry, okay? U3 to the five symmetry, huge uh, global symmetry of this, uh, of this first part of the Lagrangian, okay? Now, this is a small note. Uh, as you can, as you know, a, a unitary matrix can always you can always uh, pull out a face and write it as a U1 times an SUN, okay? So this is always true. So UN is like U1 times SUN. SUN means that the determinant of the matrix is, is one. And so since in the, the general unitary matrix has a determinant, which is a face, you can always put this face in the front and this is the U1, okay? And so the U3 to the five can also be written as a U1 to the five times as U3 to the five. And this U1 to the five is a separate global phase transformation for all these, for all these fields, but the same phase for all the generations, okay? This is just a small, small note, okay. Now, the, this big flavor symmetry is no longer a symmetry of this green Yukawa part of the Lagrangian, okay? Uh, LY breaks the symmetry partially, okay? This is the form of LY. These are the interactions between the fermions 
the, the left-handed fermions with the right-handed fermions via a Higgs field. Okay, here what you're doing is this is an SU2 doublet, and then you are canceling the SU2 charge with the with the Higgs doublet. And then whatever it remains, uh, which is the hypercharge, you cancel it with the with the SU2 singlet, which is the right-handed one. In the case of the U type uh, right-handed quarks, you have to do a trick here. This you can do because SU2 is a pseudo real representation. So here uh, sigma two is, is the Pauli matrix. Uh, okay. You can check this explicitly that this term is also invariant and there is U2 transformations. But anyway, this is this is the, the, the extra part of the Lagrangian. Okay. And this has no flavors. This breaks the full flavor symmetry, not, not the whole thing, but this, this is not symmetric under the full flavor group. Okay. And this is easy to see because if you transform this differently from this, then this whole term is not invariant anymore. Okay. Uh, in this term, these matrices, these are gen completely generic three by three uh, matrices in flavor space. However, um, one can use this uh, flavor symmetry, U3 to the five, to rotate things around, okay? You know that these rotations will, so you know that the blue part of the Lagrangian will not care about this uh, transformation. So you can use the flavor symmetry at will. If you're looking only to the Yukawa Lagrangian, you don't have to worry about the other, the other pieces. They will not uh, complain, okay? Um, so use the U3 to the five symmetry to rotate the, these things around, okay? And then this is an exercise for the, for the tutorial. Uh, you can always assume that these completely general flavor matrices have this form, okay? So you can always put the, the leptonic Yukawa matrix you can always put it in diagonal form. Um, and then this U, Yukawa matrix also can be put in diagonal form, but then uh, you're not allowed to diagonalize uh, D because you have already used all your freedom you had, but you can always uh, put the non-diagonal uh, part uh, in front in such a way that the D type uh, Yukawa matrix is always given by a diagonal matrix times a unitary matrix, which is called the CKM matrix. Okay, so this is how the CKM matrix appears. You can always uh, switch this around. So you can always decide to diagonalize the down type, and then you have the CKM matrix in the up type. But I will use this convention. Uh, this is the this sometimes called the up. Uh, the up, uh, so the up basis, uh, okay? Uh, for me, it's more useful, but some people use the other one. This is the SIGA matrix here, and uh, it's a three times three matrix parameterized by three angles and one phase. So, I mean, um, if you have a general unitary matrix, a general unitary matrix, uh, typically can be uh, parameterized as n, n minus one divided by two angles, okay? And n, n plus one divided by two faces, okay? So in, in the case of n equals three, one would have three uh, angles, so three angles, and uh, three, times four divided by two, six faces. So six faces. So this is the general thing for a three times three uh, unitary matrix. However, as I will show later, and I already mentioned, there is a remaining flavor symmetry. So the Yukawa, um, the Yukawa terms break the, S, the U3 to the five symmetry, but not completely. There is still a remaining symmetry which has uh, five degrees of freedom. And these degrees of freedom can be used to re uh, remove five of these six phases. And that's why at the end, the CK matrix 
can always be written in a way that is parameterized by three angles and one phase. Okay, this is the the usual way one writes the the CKM matrix, and 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 this uh, I think you probably also know from from the standard model course. Okay, now. Um, how do you choose these three angles and phase? Uh, you can do several things, but the useful parametrization is the Wolfenstein parametrization, okay? Uh, which is uh, obtained by doing a sort of an expansion in what is called the Kabibo parameter, lambda, which is uh, essentially VUS, okay? One obtains uh, an experimental fact that VUS is small, uh, so it's about the, uh, one over five or one over four, and then one can expand. And this is uh, the form of the Wolfenstein parametrization, which is uh, uh, represented in terms of four so-called Wolfenstein parameters, lambda, A, rho, and eta. Okay, we will use this Wolfenstein parametrization in the, in the exercise session, okay? And in fact, we will extract this, uh, these four parameters from from experiment in the in the tutorial. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? I think you all know this. Okay. All right. So. Okay. This is uh, so far uh, all fine. Now uh, you know the Higgs uh, acquires a vacuum expectation value. Okay. Um, and, and in fact, the age you can always write in this way, U is a U, as you do transformation. And the fact that you have this V here is because when you put to zero all the, all the fluctuations of the field, you are left with this uh, zero V configuration for H, which is not zero. And that's why it's a vacuum expectation value. And then uh, if you write all the Lagrangian in terms of this small h field, which is the Higgs, you uh, see that the Yukawa Lagrangian contains some quadratic um, interactions in the fermions without any Higgs fields, uh, which look like masses for the fermions, okay? You have some masses, you have the fermions, and then uh, this is a, a three by three admission matrix. And if you do the exercise, you see that this matrix here is related to the Yukawa couplings uh, just by a factor, which is V over square root of two, okay? And since we are working in this uh, completely general basis where the Yukawas are diagonal in the lepton and U quark uh, uh, sectors, uh, these mass matrices are immediately diagonal for electrons and for quarks, U-type quarks, okay? While they are not diagonal for D-type quarks uh, and one finds the CK matrix here. So, so this is ME, this is MU, diagonal matrices. This is also a diagonal matrix, but then one has the CK matrix here, okay? So at this point, it's fine. Of course, one would wants to work with diagonal masses. Otherwise, one, ha one has a propagating D-type uh, quark that is so oscillating all the time. And this is, uh, for practical purposes, uh, a, a, a nuisance. So, so one would like to avoid this. And then one, uh, what is uh, typically doing is rotating uh, the left-handed D-type uh, fields separately from the U1, so the, from the from the U, from the up type fields, okay? This is not a rotation you are allowed to do if you want to uh, keep uh, the, 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 the SU to left uh, invariant form of the Lagrangian intact, okay? But uh, since you have already broken the symmetry, you, you may do that as well, and that's not a problem. Uh, so you rotate this independently in order to diagonalize this uh, down type uh, matrix, okay? And this uh, automatically gives you all diagonal terms, but since this is not a, a, a symmetry that you can perform, uh, then you are immediately changing something else. And in fact, what you're changing is the, the coupling of the quarks to the W, 
which now contains this uh, CKM matrix here. And this is why uh, the W will now change the flavor. Okay, before uh, all, the, all the kinetic terms of the fermions were fermion diagonal, the, the, the blue part of the Lagrangian was completely flavor diagonal. There were no flavor transitions, but now since you forced this uh, illegal transformation on your fermion fields, now you have this, uh, these uh, interactions which change flavor, okay? Uh, nothing else changes. So the set uh, couplings are also diagonal. The photon couplings are diagonal, etc. The Higgs couplings are diagonal. The only thing that contains a flavor uh, transition is the W coupling in the standard model. Okay. Um, so this is a crash scores on standard model and flavor in the standard model. Here there is a small note. Uh, so this relation between the masses and the Yukawa couplings will be modified if there is PSM physics. And I will talk about that briefly later on in chapter three. Any questions up to this point? You all know this? No answer? Okay, I will assume yeah. you do. Uh, no, they, so, so it was a nice uh, brief summary of, of what Yuval covered earlier in the week. So I think they are quite familiar with this now. Excellent. So, so yeah, you're good to go to the next stage. Okay, right. So as I said before, um, the Yukawa uh, term um, still respects a subgroup of the of the full flavor group, which is this uh, five parameter uh, transformation. Uh, it's, a, it's a product of, of five U1 transformations. The one that's called, that is B because it's uh, essentially baryon number. Okay, so it's you transform all the uh, quark fields with the same phase. This is still a, a, a symmetry of the Yukawa Lagrangian. Then there are separate phases for each separate uh, lepton field, left-handed and right-handed at the same time, okay? This is this is these three U1 factors here. And then of course, the U1 hypercharge, which is a global symmetry because it's a gauge symmetry, okay? Um, so this is a U1 uh, to the five global symmetry of the standard model, which is a subgroup of the full flavor group, which is still respected by the Yukawa. And the fact that the, there are five, this is what I mentioned before, you can use this to remove five phases uh, of the CK matrix. Okay, so um, two comments at this stage. Um, this unbroken U1 to the five symmetry of the standard model is called an accidental symmetry of the standard model. And it's called an accidental symmetry because it's not something it's imposed, but it's something that is give. It appears for free from the gate symmetry. It's not related to the gate symmetry, but but when you impose the gate symmetry, you immediately get for free this uh, this uh, this global symmetry, and this is called an accidental symmetry. Okay. Another comment is that if the Yukawa couplings are small, then this uh, you could regard this Yukawa part of the Lagrangian. As a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a small interaction, okay, or so a, a small perturbation of the full Lagrangian. And then you could regard the full flavor uh, symmetry group as an approximate symmetry. This is not the case in general, because, uh, the, the, for example, the top Yukawa coupling is, is, is very large, for example. So, so this is truly not a, a, a perturbation. Uh, however, uh, the Yukawa couplings for the first two generations are, are very small. And so, for example, it's uh, many times very useful to regard uh, U2 to the five as an approximate symmetry of the, of the standard model. Okay? And this also helps a lot to understand the flavor structure when, when one is doing BSM physics okay? and interpreting uh, experimental data in terms of, 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 of beyond standard model uh, physics. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about the, the, the standard model. Now let me go beyond and let's try to argue that the standard model is, is really an effective field theory. 
And this is essentially based on this uh, weird axiom of renormalizability. So this was uh, uh, something that was uh, historically uh, motivated just because if you didn't do this, you wouldn't be able to calculate anything, okay? So uh, if you cannot renormalize, then you cannot calculate and therefore what your theory is useless. So they came up with this idea, if you stop at dimension four, then that's fine, you can calculate and, 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 uh, and, and in particular, you get things like QED and things like this, which, which, uh, which work very well and, and you can do loops and, and things like this. So traditionally, this, this uh, was just an action that was introduced uh, because otherwise you couldn't do anything, okay? Um, so let me, let me give you an example of this. Okay, uh, because then I will tell you what the solution is. Okay, so imagine that I'm writing my standard model Lagrangian, and instead of stopping uh, at uh, at the, with the operators of dimension four, I decide to add the, this operator that you see here. This is a four fermion operator. So if you count dimensions, it's three halves, three halves, three halves, three halves. So that's dimension six. So you, if you only supposed to write dimension four operators, this is not allowed, but let's assume you do, okay? This, on the other hand, this is perfectly well-defined operator. It's Lorentz invariant, okay? It is because it has, it's a product of two Lorentz invariant currents. Uh, it's gauge invariant, okay? Because uh, these are doublets, but this is uh, separately uh, gauge invariant uh, um, combinations. Um, so everything is, is, is perfectly fine with you. So operator, the only problem is dimension six, but let's assume one introduces this operator uh, such that your Lagrangian now looks like this, okay, the standard model plus this uh, extra term. And from the point of view of dimensions, you know the, the, the Lagrangian of the standard model has some dimensionless couplings and some uh, dimension for operators. And the, you also have a, a, a mass of the Higgs, okay? The, the mu square parameter times, times an operator of dimension two. And then you could include the cosmological constant if you want, this would have a, 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 lambda, so a lambda to the fourth. Uh, so by power counting, you see that this coefficient has dimensions of one over M square, okay? And in principle, this is what the problem uh, of renormalizability uh, comes from. So let's take this Lagrangian and let's calculate this amplitude here. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, electron muon uh, elax uh, elastic scattering. Okay, so if you calculate this, you would start writing like perfectly legitimate uh, QED diagrams. So an electron going in, an electron going out, interacting with a photon with a muon. Then you have also some some contributions, uh, loop contributions in QED, okay? So instead of exchanging one photon, you exchange two photons. Uh, then you have this contact interaction from this uh, operator here. So you can insert the, this leads to a Feynman rule that looks like this, okay? With a, with a Feynman rule that is I times C, uh, one, one, two, two, BLL, which is the weird name I given to this coefficient. Okay, so this is easy to calculate. It's uh, actually, that, that, that's, that's the contribution. But then you can start doing this kind of loops, okay, where you have uh, two insertions of this operator like this. So this is this fish, uh, this uh, sweet type diagram, okay? And the problem here is that uh, this will give a divergent contribution and what do you have here if you want to renormalize this, this amplitude? Well, you have to include a counter term that looks like a four fermion interaction. However, uh, if you look at the scaling of this guy, this goes like two insertions of this coefficient. This coefficient is one over M squared. And therefore, this needs a contribution that is a counterterm contribution, which is one over m squared. While a counterterm of this type will only be of one over square, one over m squared. So this forces forces you to include an extra operator, 
with the right dimensions. In this particular case, it's an operator of this type where you have this uh, two electrons, two muons, but then you have two derivatives. This is dimension eight. So this three, 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 so uh, three halves, three halves, three halves, three halves, one, one. This is dimension eight. Um, and you need this operator because you need a counter term that looks like this, okay? There is a, I can show you later if I have some time, I did this small calculation. Um, if you, if you calculate, uh, you actually have two diagrams, not only this one, but the one with you interchange the, 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 the muons, uh, uh, okay? And then if you calculate this, uh, you get something with the structure of the operator you want, okay? But then you get the one over epsilon, and then you get uh, this uh, kinematic dependence in terms of the Mandelstadt variables S and U, which gives you the extra powers of mass you need, okay? And this divergence can be canceled by a counter term of a dimension eight operator uh, defined by this. So it's, it's the type of operator that I wrote here, although you need like two different, uh, two, uh, two different structures with the derivatives entering in different places. But this is an exercise you could do. Also can show you later, I calculated this in a mathematical notebook. But the point is that if you include this operator, uh, then you are screwed because now you have to include this operator. But then when you include this operator, then you, you also get the same kind of, of contributions from this operator. And for this, you need a counter term of a, of a dimension, uh, of a dimension uh, 12 operator and so on. So it, this never ends. And then you are forced to include an infinite number of operators with an infinite number of counter terms. And then your, your, uh, uh, your theory becomes completely unpredictable, unpredictable, okay? So this is the problem. The solution is to Adi, adopt, yes? There's a question in the chat box. How is the subscript, how is the superscript VLL on the operator motivated? Yes, um, okay. Sure. Um, uh, this is this is um, uh, it's uh, this subscript here, no? This is what you're asking. Yes. yes, yes yeah. Yes. This is not important. This is uh, v is vector, and left left is because because you see this is a gamma with an index. So this is a vector current. This is a vector current. So you have two vector currents, but you have this left left. So this has the structure of, of gamma p left, gamma p left. So this means vector, uh, left-handed vector, left-handed vector, okay? So for example, a, a, if, I, if I use a, an operator which has, a, which has v left right, for example, then this would mean that I would have gamma p left, a gamma p right. So it's just a code to, to be able to, to know what this means uh, without having to go to the tables and look at it, uh, uh, right? Okay. And one, one, two, two means the generations, right? One, two, two means this is generation one, generation one, generation yeah. two, generation two. So okay. if I put one, one, three, three, I would put here a tau and a tau. Yeah. Okay, so it's just notation. At the end, there are, I will, I will mention how many operators you have. And you will see that there are enough operators in order to develop some, some notation that helps you to, to know <laughs> what operators you're talking about. But uh, since I already told you which operator this is, um, uh, this notation so far is, is not uh, really needed. Uh, I don't know, for example, how I would call this operator. This, this, I, this I don't know. Um, I don't think we have a notation for that yet. Okay. So what is the solution to this problem? The solution to this problem is to adopt what is called the power counting, okay? Power counting is the following. Uh, as, as you can see, uh, I already told you that this, is co this uh, uh, coefficient goes like one over lambda squared because it has to have the right dimensions to, to give a Lagrange of dimension four, okay? While this coefficient of this operator here, since this is a dimension eight operator, this coefficient needs to have a scaling of one over lambda to the four. Now, if I'm doing experiments uh, uh, at, uh, at energies E much smaller 
than whatever is the scale that appears in this scaling, then whatever amplitude I'm calculating will be, uh, I will be able to write it as an expansion in E over lambda. Okay, so for example, if I'm calculating the, this amplitude here, okay, and I'm really doing an experiment where I have like uh, external kinematics given by the Mandelstam variables, okay, then this amplitude um, will have, will start with the standard model, okay, which will be one. And then I have a contribution like this, which will be uh, proportional to E over lambda uh, square. Okay, and then I will have an extra term which goes like uh, one, over, one over lambda to the fourth. So I have to give the right dimensions to the thing. So I will have uh, energy and so on. So this is an expansion where this is small. Okay, so if we were to fix or if we were to fix order in, in E over lambda, okay, for example, we were to order E square over lambda square, then this contribution is of higher order. And so I don't need to I, I don't need to consider it. So I don't need to consider this contribution, although these are dimension six operators that contribute to this term. This is just something that is suppressed. So I will not put it. And since I don't need to put this, I don't need to now include any counter term of a dimension eight operator. And so I don't need to include the operator. Okay. So when you have a when you have a, an effective field theory. You have to define a power counting, or, or, or the word effective field theory already incorporates uh, the concept of a power counting that tells you that you can stop uh, writing operators at some point. And this can be renormalized, and you can work with it to any order in, in quantum corrections, and that's fine. So the, the old idea that an EFT is non renormalizable, or, the, or, or even the, 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 the name non renormalizable operator is misleading in this context, in the context of an effective field theory with a, with a power counting. So if this can be renormalized, we do renormalize if this all the time and everything is perfectly fine. And this means that the action of renormalizability is now less motivated than was before, okay? So removing this axiom, I would write the Lagrangian as the standard model containing dimension operator, so operators dimension less than four. And I would decide how many extra operators of higher dimension I include, depending on how precise I want to go in my, in my predictions uh, in the expansion of E over lambda, okay? So the obs any observable will be the observable calculated in the standard model plus, uh, contributions from operators of dimension five, contributions of operators of dimension six, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Now, what is this lambda? This lambda is a physical scale. This lambda is something, some BSM scale, some, some, some physical thing, uh, I call BSM, but uh, it's, 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 it's just some, some physical thing. So it's some, some vacuum expectation value or some, some composite, uh, um, 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 density, whatever it is, okay? It's something going on at higher energies, okay? Um, so this is a, a physical thing. Now, if, if, this, if this lambda parameter is large, okay, then um, this already explains why the standard model uh, and this axiom of renormalizability has been so successful, not because it's true. It's just because uh, the energies we are, we are uh, using to do the, the experiments are so much smaller than this lambda parameter that so far this has been completely undetectable, okay? And so this explains, so the, renormal, the, 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 the renormalizability axiom explains itself in the sense that if you remove it, you understand everything. And so the current consensus is that the standard model is, is, is really an EFT in the sense that uh, you, you should add all the possible operators of higher dimension up to the order uh, at which you want to work. And this uh, is just given by the energy of your experiment and the precision you want to, you want to reach in your calculations. 
So now let's talk about the, the standard model EFT. I have uh, three minutes, I believe. So I will just tell you how many operators you have. Um, so you can look at this paper. This paper contains all the, all the information at dimension six. We have one dimension five operator, which is called the Weinberg operator. And we have uh, 59 plus four dimension six operators. I divided 59 plus four because four are breaking by a number and this is important enough. But in general, you have 63 dimension six operators. Okay, up to flavor, because then all these operators, you have to, you have to start putting the flavor indices. If you include the flavor indices, you have 12 dimension five operators. Okay, so this one becomes 12. And then you have uh, this 59 becomes uh, 2,499 be uh, conserving uh, dimension six operators. And this four becomes 546 uh, be violating uh, dimension six operators, okay? So you see that the thing exponentiates so 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 much that it uh, looks as if this is now quite hopeless. However, uh, there is one very interesting example here, uh, which is this dimension five operator or this twelve dimension five operators. Uh, they have this form. Okay, this is the only dimension five operator up to flavor that you can write consistent with the standard model gauge symmetry, okay? Two Higgs fields, two lepton fields. And this is a charge conjugation matrix, okay? If you put flavor, uh, then you have these uh, indices here, and then you have 12 because you have three times three, but then you have some, some, some permutation symmetry, okay? Um, so that gives you 12, okay? Uh, in the case of dimension six, you have this uh, dimension uh, six uh, B violating observables, like for example, this one here. And, and then if you include uh, all these four flavor indices that you are allowed to put here, then uh, you get uh, 81 independent observables, that's 162. So this single B violating operator it's really 162 uh, different operators when once you include flavor, okay? The other three will give you the rest that you need to, up to 546. So, so far, this looks uh, rather uh, pointless. Uh, however, I will try to, to argue that this is not pointless and that in fact, it's very interesting. Uh, I believe in uh, three hours from now or something like this. So I can I can stop here now that it's ten o'clock, and and I continue I continue later. Hey, um, Any questions? Th thank you, Javier. So, any questions on this? Uh, Hello. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. Uh, are, is there any reason, reason that uh, we have to be restricted in uh, three flavors indices only uh, when we introduce new operators? Can you repeat the question, please? Is there any reason that we have to be restricted in uh, three flavor indices when we uh, uh, introduce new operator? Like, can't we have more, uh, include more generations to the new operators? Yes. Okay. Um, so you can include more generations. So you, 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 that's a good question. So you would say, maybe there is an additional generation. Okay. Okay. Then this is, this is a different theory. This is a theory with fourth generation. So this is, the, as, I, as I defined the standard model before, I, I have to specify the matter content and the matter content contains three generations. Now you say, no, I'm interested, I'm interested in the possibility that there are more generations. Okay, uh, that's, that's, a good, that's, a good, that's a good idea. However, um, you have to ask yourself, is this fourth generation light or is this fourth generation heavy? Okay, 
if it's light, then uh, you should also you should also have this dimension four contributions in the standard model. So in the so the dimension four part of the Lagrangian should also contain these these extra fermions. Okay, aside from, and and then you can also include more dimension six operators and so. If it's heavy, then uh, it will not appear in this theory. Okay, because uh, this is an effective field theory, and the effective field theory only contains the degrees of freedom that are dynamical in the at the energies that you are working on. Okay, so at, at the electron scale, for example. Uh, then you wouldn't have these uh, fermions in your in your EFT. This doesn't mean that they will not affect uh, the the theory. They, they, they will they will as we will um, discuss uh, later on. They will affect the the coefficients of your operators. Okay, but they, they will not appear uh, in as as dynamical fields in your operators. Okay, so if if you have higher uh, higher so uh, if you have extra generations with with higher masses. Uh, they do not appear in this theory in the operators. If they are lighter, yes. Uh, however, uh, it's phenomenologically difficult to have uh, a, a fourth light generation uh, uh, at the electric scale uh, because we haven't seen it. But you are uh, welcome if you want to uh, prove that this is not excluded yet. Uh, you're you're welcome to i mean there are many many constraints for example concerning the the existence of new fermions uh with masses below the for example the set um, the set mass and so on no because the set decays and and then you can actually count how many how many particles you have in the decay like how many neutrinos light neutrinos you have things like this Okay, and then there, there are a million constraints on, on, on how many generations of uh, fermions you have. Um, also, for example, you do E plus E minus to, to uh, so E plus E minus to, to any energy, you, you expect to create fermion anti fermion. And then you see clearly uh, when you increase the energy, how, how, uh, how you open up the thresholds of higher. Uh, of more massive fermions, so you see the you see the the, the strange threshold, you see the the, the charm threshold, the, the, the tau threshold, etc. You see how these thresholds open up, so you can count uh, the, the, how many particles, how many fermions you have, okay? And and at some point, the, the, this, this stops. <laughs> so so for sure, new generations are heavier than some some limit which is not small. Um, yeah. Okay, so in SMEFT, we don't introduce any new kind of fields, uh, but uh, but we can include those in any other EFT, right? Like if we want to constrain any uh, any coupling, uh, like they will appear in the coefficients you said. So to, uh, to satisfy the constraints, we can include those at uh, heavy scales, right? Yes. So if you have heavy particles, um, these heavy particles will affect the, the values, the specific values of the, of the Lagrangian parameters. Okay. This, this, I mean, I will discuss this and we will exp explicitly calculate this, this, this coefficient. So let's see. So um, let's see this coefficient here, for example. Um, this coefficient of this operator, okay? Um, this coefficient has a value, and this value uh, can be calculated in principle, okay? And if you have heavy particles, these heavy particles that do not appear in the in the in the EFT because it's a low energy effective theory, uh, they will they will they will affect this the value of this coefficient. And the, the interesting thing is that for higher, that for, so what quote unquote non renormalizable operators, uh, this, this, these things can be calculated as a function of the masses of the heavy particles and so on. Um, 
for, for, for the coefficients of the dimension four operators, for example, the, the coupling constants uh, and so on, uh, there is a problem. The problem is that since they are renormalizable couplings, um, although in principle you expect this to be calculable in terms of uh, high energy physics, like new particles and so on, uh, uh, the, the fact that they can be, so the fact that they are renormalizable means that the, uh, you you cannot distinguish them from whatever other values they may have. So you, I mean, but but for the higher dimensional oper uh, operators, these these coefficients can be calculated. We will do a few examples, and you will see that if you have heavy particles. Uh, you will see how they affect the the values of these coefficients. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, don't see any other questions for now, um, but we, we'll see you. Yeah, l later this afternoon, whenever it's about four hours from now, I think, or something. So, th th thanks very much, Javier, and um, speak to you later. Okay, thank you.